So that's a good morning. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all morning, the Sophie yeah. delegates. So to all the Sophie delegates from world over, and that's fantastic to meet you all. Fantastic to meet you all. I'm very happy that you, we are all here, healthy, happy, and safe, safe during these pandemic conditions. Well, we ha have our speaker joining us. We have our speaker joining us. Yes, he's here. So welcome to the international webinar, SOFI 2020, Sustainable Ornamental Fisheries Way Forward, organized by School of Industrial Fisheries, Cochin University of Science and Technology. SOFI 2020 is truly an international webinar. Nine speakers from seven countries, and we already have 1,500 registered participants. Applaud. Yes. I'm Dr. Mini, M-I-N-I, from School of Industrial Fisheries, Cochin University of Science and Technology, the organizing secretary of SOFI 2020. Warm welcome to our speaker, first speaker, Swain A. Fozo from Norway. Good morning, Swain. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Yes. Let me introduce Swain A. Fozo to you. Swain Fozo is a leading international voice for responsible and sustainable practices in aquarium trade, pet trade policies, and legislations worldwide. His degree in biology from University of Bergen, specializing in systematic ichthyology, led him to the world of pets and aquatic ornamentals as a leading consultant world-renowned author and orator on aquarium technique, ichthyology, reef aquarium keeping, and reef animals. Swain Foza, the former president of OFI, adorned the position for, for four years, and now he is a vice president of OFI. He has been representing OFI in CITES meetings in the past two decades. Eight conference of parties, COP COP 11 to 18, and meetings of the Animal Committee, 12 of them since the year 2000, several CITES workshops, interim working groups, and three FAO expert advisory panels for the assessment of proposal to amend CITES appendices. Yes, Swain A. Fozo is the most appropriate person to speak on CITES and ornamental fish trade. Where are we? Where are we going? Fozo is also the president of European Pet Organization for the seventh time, secretary general and board chairman, Norwegian Pet Trade Association, president of Scandinavian Pet Trade Organization, editor-in-chief of Pet Scandinavia Norway. Swain, the screen is all yours now. Thank you, Minnie. And hello, everyone. I miss you. I missed the opportunity to look directly at each other and every one of you and interact during the breaks to discuss the topics we are dealing with in this webinar. It's a strange world we find ourselves in at the moment. And why should I then be talking about CITES, a conservation topic, and how it relates to the trade in ornamental fish organisms? Why? Why is a conservation issue relevant in the ornamental fish industry? It should be self-evident. Besides the obvious responsibility towards the planet and human society that we all have, the customers expect the ornamental fish trade to be sustainable, animal welfare focused and conservation minded. Let me make it absolutely clear. I am a strong believer in the importance of CITES, or rather, I used to be a strong believer in the importance of CITES. Now I'm not that sure anymore. The way CITES has been developing over the last several years shows that it is more and more dominated by animal rights-based beliefs of trade in animals being something bad. Rather than regulating the species that can benefit, we see increasingly more attempts of the parties voting in favor of blanket bans on trade, 
or at least listings that in principle lead to bans on trade. Often against the recommendations of the CITES Secretariat, against the recommendations of the FAO, of the IUCN, and of others who have a deeper understanding of conservation mechanisms. Last year, at the conference of the parties, this had turned so bad that several member countries openly threatened to leave CITES unless things improve. That's a scary thought, even for me, as I do see the benefits of an effective CITES, which we will not have if member countries start to leave. We will also not have an effective CITES if the development continues to drift further away from effective species conservation into a ban all animal rights agenda. At this point, I have to make a disclaimer. I may say things during the talk that you will have problems to understand and relate to. After all, the audience for this talk is extremely varied and the previous knowledge of CITES as well as of the ornamental fish industry is likely to vary hugely. I hope though, that we will have time to clear up possible misunderstandings or matters that appear unclear in the question round after my talk. Let's get the presentation rolling. I'll see if I can share it with you. So I hope you now see the screen with the title of my talk, CITES and Ornamental Fish Trade. Where are we? Where are we going? To begin with, uh, I will absolutely not be able in the time I have for this talk to explain everything about CITES, any possible question you might have. So I can just as well start by uh, pointing you to two very good online sources. The website of CITES, www.citus.org, and the online publication, The Evolution of CITES, a 938 pages thick book on how CITES have developed over the years all important decision, et cetera, et cetera, from a former Secretary General of CITES, uh, Willem Weinsteckers. If you scan the QR code in this slide, you will get directly to that publication. CITES is a convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora. Remember the word trade. It came about as a, the result of a resolution from an IUCN meeting in Kenya in September 1963 and was agreed by 80 countries in Washington DC on the 3rd of March 1973. So it's already a pretty old convention. It entered into force on July the 1st, 1975, when the first 10 countries had ratified uh, the convention. And the first conference of the parties, known as COPs or COPs, was held in Bern in Switzerland in 1976. The CITES logo on this slide does not in any way indicate that CITES endorses or is involved in this talk. I use it on this slide as a facsimile so that you all shall recognize this important logo for everyone who is involved with trade in wildlife. CITES is important in the wildlife trade. The convention is a multilateral treaty aimed specifically at ensuring that international trade in wild animals and plants does not threaten the survival. Initially, initially, it was much more about trade than about conservation. 
Today, many people seem to think that everyone, sh everything should be on situs, no matter what the reasons might be. But it is about trade. Citus has absolutely no influence on issues like habitat loss or, reg or domestic uses. If species are threatened by, for instance, pollution, unregulated tourism, urbanization, or any other form of habitat damage or habitat loss, CITES is not the tool to deal with this. Only if it's international trade that is already the problem or is likely to become a problem unless the trade is regulated. It's no extinction insurance. As of today, CITES regulates trade in enormous numbers of species, more than 32,000 plant species and close to 6,000 animal species are covered by the treaty. And it's not only the big famous species that everyone knows uh, that are threatened in at least parts of their range, such as elephants or rhinos or tigers or pandas, uh, but CITES also covers species that hardly can be considered threaten threatened at all. The red-eyed tree frog, Agalucnis calitrias, was listed in Appendix 2 at COP15 in Qatar in 2010, and is an example of both a species that is listed because it resembles other species that are threatened, although it's not threatened itself, uh, the IUCN red list lists the species as least concern. The red eye tree frog is also an example of the growing trend of listing pet species in the appendices. Through the 20 plus years that I have followed CITES, there has been a clear tendency for more and more focus on pet species rather than species that commercially are massively more important. Very often one gets the feeling that they are proposed simply because the proposers know they will be easy to get through. The proposal to list the red-eyed tree frog was extremely weak. Hardly any sub substantial evidence for the listing, yet the species was listed with no debate whatsoever. Many of us attending the COP felt it was done because after the failure to list the severely threatened bluefin tuna moments before, the convention parties felt they had to list something at the very least. The red-eyed tree frog had everything going for it. The only commercial interest was in a segment of the pet trade that has very limited lobbying resources. And it was a beautiful species that would look good in press coverage of the importance of CITES. At the last COP, the participants could hear an official delegate talking about the listing of a reptile species with the words, it is so beautiful, it deserves to be on CITES. Are we talking science here or what? Charismatic, beautiful animals are the big thing in CITES. And if they aren't good looking to begin with, the lobbyists fighting for listings order cute plush toys that they give out to the delegates. At the average CITES COP, there are more cuddly toys than science reports on many desks. Is it a carnival or is it a science-based conference? One might at times be rightfully confused. But let's now move to the ornamental aquatic world. CITES as a general rule lists species and not populations. It is therefore not only wild caught animals that are covered, but also everything that is bred in captivity. Sometimes when a species enters the trade practically only as captive bred, the outcome may be peculiar. In her 2016 book, the American journalist Emily Voigt 
wrote about the dragonfish trade and called it a modern paradox, the mass produced endangered species. And we have quite a few examples of that. I would not be able to go into detail on all this Citus listed species of relevance to the ornamental fish trade, but you can see that there is a wide variety of species in the ornamental fish trade already covered by Citus on one of the appendices. A quick overview on appendix one, all sawfishes, two sturgeon species, Julian's golden carp, dragonfish or Asian arowana, the Mekong giant catfish. On appendix two, all nautilid cephalopods, the clarion angel, all sturgeon species that are not on appendix one, the Congo blind barb, all seahorses, the humphead wrasse, Australian lungfish, all giant clams, the queen conch, the blue corals, all Oregon pipe corals, all black corals, all stony corals, all fire corals, and all lace corals. And finally, on appendix three, Colombia has listed uh, several Potamotrigon species, that's uh, South American freshwater stingrays. Brazil has listed all the Brazilian Potamotrigon species, and they have listed the famous zebra pleco, which is very popular in the ornamental fish trade. I will get on with the importance of the different appendices later on. There are three levels of situs protect protection uh, divided on the three appendices. Appendix one covers species that are threatened with extinction already and are or may be affected by trade if it continues. All commercial trade in Appendix 1 species is, as a rule, illegal. But there is one important exception, and that is that trade in captive bred animals or cultivated plants may be allowed under very special circumstances. And I will get back to the circumstances that apply later on. Appendix one cover species that are not necessarily threatened, but may become so unless the trade is subject to regulation. Here we are not talking of downright bans normally, but the trade has to be, be followed by certain regulations. Appendix two may also include species similar uh, in appearance to species already listed, lookalike species, like the red-eyed tree frog that I mentioned. And international trade can be authorized by the granting of an export permit. And finally, you have the appendix three, which is the lowest regulation appendix in, in CITES. Here, any party may list the species of concern in the domestic fauna or flora without asking any other parties. Uh, it's a uni uh, unilateral listing which has the strictest measures only for the country that lists it. It is good to have a brief knowledge also of the phenomenon that we call source codes in CITES. There are plenty of them, and I will mention only those that are most commonly relating to species in the ornamental aquatic trade. The source codes have to be on the export documents. And a W would mean that the specimen is taken from the wild. An R will mean that the specimen is reared in a controlled environment, taken as eggs or a juvenile from the wild. 
F will mean that the animal was born in captivity, but that it does not fulfill the definition of bred in captivity as laid out in the uh, resolution conf 1016, which applies to animals with source code C. They are bred in captivity under strict regulations, acceptable to CITES, and are truly a sustainable captive breeding process. And finally, the source code D of for Appendix 1 animals that have been bred in captivity for commercial purposes. In this case, the breeder or the farm that is breeding the animals have to be certified by CITES and included in the register of the Secretariat that shows that this is a genuine captive breeding process that does not impact the wild population in any way. So what are the consequences of listing on, siting, uh, on CITES? For Appendix 1, for the very rare cases where you can trade in CITES 1 specimens for commercial purposes, uh, that is only when they are captive bred and certified. You need an export permit from the country that exports and an import permit from the country where you yourself is located in. For Appendix 2, you need an export permit and in some countries or quite many countries that it applies to all of Europe, you will also need an import permit for Appendix 2 specimens. For Appendix 3, you will need either an export permit if the export is from the country that has listed the species in Appendix 3, or you will need the CITES certificate of origin if it comes from any other country. And for all the appendices, there is an increasing demand from authorities that you need some kind of proof of legal acquisition of the breeding stock. If the animals come from the wild, it's obvious you need a non-detriment finding to get the export permits. But for captive breeding, it's something new that the trade is beginning to see the need for proving where their breeding stock originated. A good and somewhat frightening example is what happened to the African gray parrot. It was listed on appendix, uh, appendix two for many, many years, which meant that South Africa could build a huge captive breeding operation for this species. If we look into the CITES trait database, uh, I updated this statistic as uh, recently as on October 6th. You can see the breeding of African gray parrots in South Africa increasing uh, the export from South Africa of captive bred uh, specimens increased from, in 2006, 4,460 specimens until in 2016, 112,926 specimens. But in 2016, the CITES Conference of the Parties number 17 in Johannesburg decided to uplist the species to Appendix 1 in what was perceived as an attempt to stop the illegal trafficking of wild caught African grey parrots out of Central Africa. This was against the recommendation of the CITES Secretariat. It was against the recommendation of IUCN. And still it was done. 
as for some people, it's more important to stop the trade in live animals than to actually achieve conservation uh, results. After the listing on Appendix 1, the export from South Africa became terribly difficult. And in 2018, only 1,174 specimens were exported from South Africa. A sustainable captive breeding process of a important species fell from 112,000 to just above 1,000 specimens because of the added bureaucracy of an Appendix 1 listing. And this is terrible for the general trade because South Africa was the big supplier. Here you see in blue the exports from South Africa and in red the total exports in the same period from all countries in the world. South Africa trade suffered tremendously and the world trade went from captive bred to increased smuggling out of Central Africa. There is several organizations who have published evidence that the uh, illegal capture of wild African gray parrots in several countries has increased manifold. The prices for wild caught smuggled birds have quadrupled after the uplisting to one, uh, Appendix 1. The only trade that has suffered is the captive breeding. And the reason? The breeders couldn't very quickly prove legal acquisition of the parent stock. A legal acquisition finding determines whether the specimen and the parental stock were obtained in accordance with the provisions of any national laws for the protection of wildlife and plants, and if previously traded, that it was traded internationally in accordance with the provisions of CITES. The problem is that with an Appendix 2 listing, which the species was on before, no one needed to save paperwork. And very many didn't have this paperwork. It took several years before things started to normalize in the sense that breeders could prove that they had legal parental stock for their breeding operations. Today, the register of operations at CITES shows a lot of farms in South Africa that now are allowed to export birds again. And I hope that the coming statistics will show that, that trade in captive bred specimens again is increasing uh, so that the profits for illegal trafficking in wild birds will drop. But it's still a long way until all the breeders that previously were supplying birds in South Africa are CITES certified. Could something like this happen in the fish world? Let's look at an example that gives me plenty of concern. The South American stingrays, the Putamotrigonidae, were first brought to the CITES table in 2004. And since then, Loads of working groups, workshops, and listing proposals followed to get them under the CITES umbrella. The range countries that fought for this listing, primarily Colombia and Brazil, were not able to convince the parties that they deserved the listing, though, not least because the trade associations present in the meetings were able to demonstrate how important captive breeding in non-range countries actually is for these species. And that there is very little reason to suspect that wild harvest is a substantial threat to the species in the wild. 
I was personally among those who recommended to Colombia and Brazil in several meetings that they should rather list the species of concern on Appendix 3, which any party, as you remember, can do without consulting others or needing a vote. An Appendix 3 listing will not have equal levels of control, but it will give a fair picture of how the trade is made up since all international trade has to be followed by CITES certificates. Export permits from the countries that list them and certi certificates of origin from all other countries. Brazil and Colombia listed the stingrays with effect from 2017 and the statistics thereafter paint a pretty interesting picture. You will see here for the two years where there is complete statistics that the vast majority of freshwater stingrays in the trade comes from countries outside of South America. In 2017, 3,500 specimens were legally exported from countries in South America, while 14,622 mainly came from captive breeding in Asian countries. In 2018, there were 10,220 specimens legally exported from South America and 36,000 specimens from the rest of the world, again, mainly Asia. This shows that the trade associations were totally right. The trade in wild caught stingrays today is minuscule compared to the captive breeding which goes on in the main markets. At the same time as the stingrays went on Appendix 3, so did the zebra pleco, hypensistra zebra. Brazil has maintained that massive numbers have been going out of the country illegally via Colombia and Peru. But at the same time, we who are familiar with the trade have been observing a massive increase in captive breeding of the species. I never really bought into this notion that there should be gigantic numbers of smuggled specimens going through the ornamental aquatic trade in the neighboring countries of Brazil. These photos are from the superb facilities of Balance Fish Farm in Jakarta, Indonesia, that breeds huge quantities of zebra plecos, as well as of many other rare catfishes. I can't see any reason why there should be profit in smuggling zebra plecos from Brazil via neighboring countries. And the statistics show that I'm probably right. The registered trade after the zebra pleco was listed on Appendix 3 shows that in 2017, there were nine specimens coming out of Colombia and 6,792 coming from captive breeding in the rest of the world, most from Indonesia. In 2018, 60 specimens from Colombia and 10,000 from the rest of the world. This does of course not mean that there couldn't still be illegal trade coming out from South America. But like all regulations, you do not stop, stop smuggling and illegal trafficking by killing the legal, regulated and transparent trade. Sometime people must learn that if you stop the captive bread trade, you end up with more profit for smugglers. But it was again this with traceability to prove legal acquisition. 
at the moment, there is no demand that people who breed stingrays or zebra plecos have to prove any kind of legal acquisition of the parent stock. But uh, what would happen if these species or something completely else moves up on CITES and there is a demand to prove where the specimens you breed originate from? Could you be demanded to show the whole chain from the wild harvester via management authorities, exporters, importers, all the way up to yourself who is a breeder? And what then if there is a break in this chain that you are unable to show that your parent stock actually was legally acquired? Could we end up with a situation like with the African grey parrot? I hear a lot of background noise and I'm afraid that is not coming from me, it's coming from someone else who is logged on, so I hope that whoever does it can mute their speaker. I think that we will see more and more aquatic species coming on CITES. And we could expect more and more bureaucracy related to these listings. A very relevant example is what happened at the last conference of the parties, the COP18 in 2019, where there was made decisions that the CITES Secretariat shall convene a workshop on the conservation management of and trade in marine ornamental fishes. This in order to report back to the Animals Committee, the 32nd uh, meeting of the Animals Committee for finally decision making at COP19. What does this mean and why this sudden interest in marine ornamental fishes? Well, I think I've already explained one very good reason for interest in anything in citing, CITES is listing proposals. It's so important for several interest groups to get more and more species on CITES whether they belong there or not, whether it's with the approval of the site secretariat or against the recommendations of the secretariat. Things end up on CITES for the strangest of reasons at times and underlying in many decisions is that we don't like that people trade in live animals. Of the marine species of relevance, I'm now restricting myself to fishes only. We already have all seahorses and the clarion angel listed. These are also examples of CITES listings that have had close to zero effect on the conservation of the species. For the seahorses, Already in 2002 at the COP12, uh, the trade associations said that we don't believe this will have any positive effect. The bulk of wild harvest in seahorses is by capture in other fisheries. So the seahorses will be dead already when they come at shore, no matter whether they can be legally traded or not. And the clarion angel that was listed in 2016, uh, for this there were, were at that time and there still is no registered legal fish coming out of the only range state which is Mexico. All the specimens in the ornamental aquatic trade come from one single breeding operation in Indonesia. For seahorses, Science show now that 
there are more or less the same number of seahorses being harvested as before the listing as they are by capture. The ornamental fish trade is supplied by captive breeding. They already were in 2002, but now it's gone to 99% captive breeding. But that's minuscule quantities compared to the bycatch. The Bangai cardinal fish has been attempted to be listed on CITES two times. First in 2007 by the USA, and then again in 2016 by the EU. This listing proposal was strongly opposed by Indonesia, who along with the trade associations didn't believe that this would in fact have any positive effects on the management of the species in the range in Indonesia. Because of the strong opposition from Indonesia, both the US in 2007 and the EU in 2016 withdrew their proposal without putting it to a vote. In 2016, it was however decided that Indonesia should implement conservation and management measures to ensure the sustainability of the international trade which they are well underway with. Uh, they have reported already twice on the measures they are taking. Another example of the interest of CITES in ornamental marine fishes was that at the COP when the Clarion Angel was listed, clearly inspired by the listing proposal, one Austrian NGO gave out this leaflet saying that at the next COP, please include all Pomacantidae, all Ketodontidae, and all Acantinidae in the CITES appendices. No arguments, no science, just a strong belief that these species are so beautiful that they deserve to be listed on CITES. At the COP, this was the document presented as the case to start CITES interest in the conservation management and trade in marine ornamental fishes. And where did it come from? It was submitted by the European Union, Switzerland and the USA. But there is obvious reasons to believe that the whole process was inspired by the Swiss organization Fondation Franz Weber, who also at the same COP published a leaflet on trade in marine ornamental fishes. They increased manifold their focus on marine ornamental fishes in the website and in the magazine. And they have some strong opinions on the trade. The aquarium industry poses a serious threat to ornamental coral reef fishes throughout the oceans, they say. Yet there are hardly any regulations, controls, or information on the impact of this trade. Nonsense. There are lots of regulations and controls. It may not be enough, but hardly any, no. Even worse, on the website, Fondation Franz Weber State, four out of five fishes die before, even, before ever reaching an aquarium. A study revealed that up to 98% of fish end up dying in captivity during the first year. What kind of businesses can live with that kind of losses? It's totally unrealistic. It would never happen. And then most revealing, Fondation Franz Weber states, we campaign against removing ornamental marine fish, corals and other animals from overseas. Plain and simple, with such a view on the aquarium trade, it is no wonder that they want to ban as much as possible of the trade.
in the decision, it's clear that CITES specifically wants to investigate international trade in non-CITES listed live coral reef fishes, the biology and conservation status of the main uh, non-CITES listed species, the fisheries management and the regulations for international trade. This was planned to be done during 2020 and 2021, but then this happened. I wouldn't say that CITES panicked because all the meetings that they were hoping to help uh, to hold had to be cancelled. But the decisions on how to move this forward, this was planned, was planned for the 31st meeting of the Animals Committee, could not be made in the normal way. So uh, the Animals Committee meeting was postponed indefinitely, as it looks now officially until 2021, but who knows if we can meet physically next year. And since then, very limited information has come from CITES, except that there has been an intercessional decision done behind closed doors by the Animals Committee that the scope of the work on marine ornamental fishes is confirmed to be as outlined in the document that should have been dealt with at the Animals Committee. And now, no one knows how CITES is taking this matter further. Several trades associations were, wrote recently a letter of concern to CITES, where we request the Secretariat and the parties to the Convention to ensure that the opportunity for full and proper consideration is given to this issue, that sufficient time is allocated to it, that the Animals Committee is given the opportunity to consider the proposal in an, the next physical meeting, and that all relevant stakeholders are given the fullest possible opportunity to engage in all aspects of this work in order to ensure the best and most robust outcomes. The trade associations therefore urge the site, the secretariat and the parties to reschedule the commencement of the implementation of the decisions made at the last COP until after the rescheduled animals committee rather than seeking to strictly adhere to previously agreed timelines, which would lead to a decision behind closed doors with limited input from the trade. A very unfortunate situation. Trade in ornamental fish, like in all pets, is massively going towards captive breeding. The marine sector is no exception. That does not mean that wild harvest necessarily is an inferior source compared to captive breeding. In a lot of cases, collecting from the wild will be just as sustainable. And more often than not, it will be more important for livelihoods and as an incentive to conservation efforts. There are plenty of good things about wild harvest. Yet, even though we still rely heavily on wild harvest of many of the species that are traded in low numbers, we are breeding more and more. Foremost of the big sellers, the bread and butter species, so to say. Therefore, some operators may be tempted to think that the CITES listing will benefit their own business, since it's, since it's thought to restrict the wild harvest to the benefit of the captive breeding. The news item you see in this slide is fake, totally fake, but I'm very used to hearing similar opinions within parts of the trade and hobby. If realities only were that simple. You have learned now that captive breeding can suffer tremendously under CITES regulations. Imagine clone fishes going on CITES. 
90% or more of these are coming from captive breeding. They are one of the most important species. It would never happen, you say? Hmm. Sorry, clone fishes could go on CITES. They would look great on CITES. They are massively traded. And some, a few though, come out of the wild. They are beautiful. They are charismatic. Think Nemo. What a simple species it could be. Most probably without any benefit whatsoever for conservation, but a massive amount of paperwork for the trade. Ornamental Fish International, OFI, along with several partner associations, stand ready to represent the industry in the coming CITES process if we allowed, are allowed to do so, like we have done so many times before. The aim is not to work against necessary conservation measures, but to get informed science-based decisions that actually have a positive effect rather than simply destroying a trade and a hobby for little or no purpose and benefiting illegal trafficking instead. We know far too well that you do not kill illegal trade by banning the legal. Our call is out to the ornamental aquatic industry to support this work by actively responding to our need for financial support, for data and for background information. We do not need a new African grey parrot issue. Thank you for your attention. I will now take questions. Thank you, Thank Swain. You. Thank you. That was a highly informative talk on CITES and ornamental fish trade. Where are we and where are we going? Well, Swain is a person who loves to talk to audience and he's ready to take questions. Yes. People have posted. People have posted in the YouTube live. Can I read out to you, Swain? Yes, please. The means to trace a species seems to be very spe uh, species and mark. You know, one second. The means to trace species seems to be vary by species and market, and can be complicated by long supply chains. What can be done to improve traceability and shorten supply chains in data poor markets? That is a question that I will need 40 minutes more for. <laughs> but uh, I fully realize that traceability is a problem in large parts of the ornamental trade. And I think I can reveal as much as in the trade associations, we are very well aware of these problems. And we are constantly having discussions attempting to find solutions that will improve the traceability. Um, but uh, the question is how much traceability do you need in all cases? Um, CITES is one way of doing this, but it's also a way to uh, make the trade in the legally acquired specimens more complicated. So it's it, there is no easy solution. We are working on it. I could only wish I could give a more detailed answer, but I cannot at the moment. Yes, thank you, Swain. That was a question by Bryce Risley. So there's another question. There's another question. How about procedure of secure strong genetic breeding when species are offered to the market. There are a lot of inbreeding going on. How about the procedure of securing strong genetic breeding when species are offered to the market? There are a lot of inbreeding going on. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I, I think that one of the other speakers in this webinar, Kapila Tissera from Sri Lanka, will be dealing directly with that issue as he's talking about genetics in ornamental fish breeding. Uh, it's not really a CITES issue and it's not my speciality, but definitely we need to uh, avoid inbreeding as it uh, reduces the quality of, of the um, uh, fish uh, stock and the fish available to the market. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Swain. Those in the Zoom can unmute and ask your questions. John, would you like to add, add some questions? Could you unmute and ask the question? Okay, I'm unmuted. It's not a question. It's more a comment. Um, I'm really, really pleased that uh, Svein has taken such great care in presenting CITES as it really is, because the impression of CITES out in the world is that this is a, a flawless, faultless organization, that it's there to save the world and save the species, which of course it should be, but it's a very imperfect uh, organization and it's got major, major flaws. It's got its users, but it's got its major flaws. And I think uh, Spain has done a great job in presenting what I believe is a very balanced view of the situation with regard to CITES. Thank you, John. Uh, I, I noticed, uh, Mini, that uh, Karen Gaynor from the CITES Secretariat is saying in the chat that they would like to respond briefly. Will yes, you please. give her the floor, please? Yes, please. Yes, please. Most welcome. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for giving me the floor. And uh, thank you, Sven, for um, for raising this issue. Um, and uh, I, you know, I do. I thank you for the, the talk that you've uh, given here today. Uh, I will be listening into the webinar for the, the three days and I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about the marine ornamental fish industry. Um, I just wanted to take the floor um, to clarify a couple of points. While I don't disagree with what you have said, I think it is important, um, un unlike what John said there, where the conception of CITES is that it's about saving all the species, I actually think there's a misconception about CITES that it's about banning trade, um, which um, in, as far as the Society Secretariat is concerned, uh, banning trade is a last resort. Mm -hmm. So if, if it gets to the point where trade needs to be banned, then CITES has failed. So this is something that we would try to avoid. I mean, CITES is about promoting sustainable trade and ensuring that the conservation of the species is maintained. So to me, CITES is not so much a trade convention, it's a, conserva it's a convention whose objective is conservation, which it achieves through trade regulation. And that's a slightly different um, perception than uh, saying it's the focus is on trade. I, I would disagree with that. And also, I think it, was in, uh, it would be important to point out that um, of the 38,000 species that CITES covers, um, so you mentioned Appendix 1 having strict protection, um, but there's only a thousand, just over a thousand species listed on Appendix 1. So it, it's not used very often. Most of the species, 30, oh, 37,420 to be exact, are listed on Appendix 2 and trade can continue in Appendix 2. It just needs to be regulated with a permit. So the, in the vast majority of cases, trade does continue. Um, and, but it is subject to a non-detriment finding, as you said. But I don't think you explained to the group what a non-detriment finding is. Um, so it is, it's a scientific assessment um, or a scientific advice um, to determine that the trade would not um, be detrimental to the survival of the species. Um, I would also say that um, you asked about what is happening now. And yes, you are 100% right that obviously we had a timeline given to us at COP18, but then nobody could have predicted that COVID was going to uh, change everybody's timeline and the way that they worked. Um, so we, like everyone else, are trying to 
find a way of continuing to move forward on things, even when we don't have uh, the luxury of being able to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, I still can't give you any further information on when that would actually take place. But what I can say, and I also can't confirm when any workshop on marine ornamental fish would take place. But what I can say is that um, we do have funding now to um, carry out uh, a number of the preparation of a number of um, background reports that could potentially be used in, the, in a workshop, should we be able to have them. So we are we will soon start to prepare work uh, documents on um, the biology, the conservation status, the trade and management, applicable trade regulations and enforcement of marine ornamental fish. And um, I completely agree with you that society should be based on science. Um, and uh, the best way of counteracting the, um, the, some, the emotional uh, arguments that we do see cropping up in, in CIDES, uh, at CIDES meetings uh, increasingly is to have the sound science and to have that information. And this is why um, there's certainly absolutely no desire to keep the industry out of these discussions. We, we understand that you have this information about what species are captive bred, you know, what, what regulations are in place um, and how sustainable all those fisheries are. So we really need the industry to engage with us in this process um, to see, to, to ensure that we have the right information. If the industry doesn't engage with us, the process will continue anyway. Um, and then you may face a situation where a party comes with a, a weak proposal. But the best way of addressing that is to be completely involved. In it. And that's why I'm so grateful to you that you have raised this with um, this audience um, who, again, uh, would have a lot of information that would be important to us. And we uh, would make a commitment that we will fully engage with the industry in this exercise. So be assured of that. Um, and uh, so I think I just wanted to, um, to yeah. clarify those few points with you. And so thank you for giving me the floor and thank you for the talk, Sven. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I, I think you made some very important clarifications and I hope you understood from my talk that I'm absolutely not of the opinion that the CITES Secretariat thinks that CITES is aiming to ban trade. Uh, I think the CITES Secretariat and the trade associations in the ornamental aquatic industry are very much on the same level when we see the need for regulations that actually are helpful to conservation. I'm rather conf uh, uh, accusing some outsiders of wanting to use CITES as a tool to ban uh, trade. Uh, I can also guarantee you that the trade associations uh, that OFI are involved with, as well as OFI itself, want nothing more than be actively involved in all work that CITES is doing relating to, to the ornamental aquatic trade. As I said in the beginning of my talk, we as an industry has a particularly strong need to be seen as sustainable and conservation minded as well as animal welfare minded simply because the customers of the trade expect us to be. So thank you again, Karen. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Sven. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, would, I, would like to yeah would like to ask uh, one question uh, to Professor Swain. Like uh, in this case of uh, in the scenario of uh, this emerging pandemics or uh, re-emerging and emerging infectious diseases, this wildlife traffic or uh, you know trade in uh, endangered animals as well as uh, exotic species from different parts. Now I've seen one of my friend in my village. I'm in a very you know far away village in my city. I'm in my district where he's keeping so many birds. The the birds which you have shown already it is with him. I've seen several of them which are very exotic. I'm always wondering. I used to tell him you be careful. 
don't go very close to you know i mean interacting so closely with them we never know something is jumping onto you and causing an infection so i see a lot of uh, things i am basically interested in nature i do keep certain things and i go there visit these things so i see a lot of danger i mean in terms of uh, whether these are properly regulated whether they are bringing in lot of stuff i see a lot of stuff which is coming with their inherent uh, microflora which includes germs also which includes potential pathogens emerging pathogens which can then jump on to the humans spread in the population which is now becoming very real so what's your opinion or how sites is actually you know uh, giving uh, a very firm control uh, to arrest or rather prevent such uh, events which are very much real uh, especially in the context of uh, covid 19 which is a pandemic i mean every almost all the countries are affected would like to hear from you thank you um uh, i th think you you are definitely not the first to ask about what cites does or should do on uh, zoonotic diseases but uh, in my view that would be a serious misuse of cites to mix in zoonotic diseases we have other qualified international agreements that deals with zoonotic disease uh, diseases not least the oie and the who uh, there have been loads of people who now see it as an opportunity that you should ban everything on cites and only release species when you can prove that they don't carry zoonotic diseases but frankly the risk isn't so gigantic that you should kill down all trade in live animals uh, the risk is probably bigger in, in industrial farming than it is in most hobby animals uh, but we need regulations also when animal health and we have regulations on animal health they will probably be stricter after covid-19 but by all means don't mix that into cites uh, that would confuse the real work that cites has to do and which is important in its own right <coughs> so the short answer yes zoonotic diseases is something we <coughs> need to take seriously but cites is not the place to regulate it Does that answer your qu uh, question? Unmute, unmute, Mr. Uh, Dr. Hatta, Professor Hatta. Professor Hatta, could you unmute? Professor Hatta, uh, we are not able. Okay, all right. Uh, so, Swain. Uh, okay we have had uh, some kind of interactions you are worried about this kind of online platforms where you would not be able to talk to people you have had some interactions right uh, there are more questions coming up uh, i think we will have a uh, couple of questions uh, uh, anybody if you want to ask you can unmute and ask we'll take a couple of questions before we close for the next session any question coming up amod amod from uh, friend of seas asks how can india play the role in global ornamental fish industry by giving focus more on sustainability he would like to know the views of swain pozo <laughs> <laughs> yes i i think that has been topics for quite a few of my lectures that i have been giving physically in india at various conferences um i think india had, has a lot of interesting potential which they currently are not using uh, the most commercially valuable indian species are produced mainly in other countries so it's it's other countries that are breeding fish that make the 
uh, income from, from the commercially important Indian species. That is unfortunate, but I think that only active help from Indian government organizations could solve that problem for, for India. I'm happy to discuss it further with, with the Indian industry, but I don't think we have time for it here today and it's not really relating to, to CITES. Thank you, Swain. School of Industrial Fisheries and from Cochin University of Science and Technology, really thank you for the highly informative talk. There are a lot of good compliments coming up in the chat boxes. We'll save it all and discuss uh, on a later time. Uh, so shall we stop uh, this uh, discussion for the time? Okay. Thank you thank very you much. Well. Thank you very much. Admin, are we stopping for this this session now? We, 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 uh, I want to remind you, all of you, all of you here in the platform, I want you to remind you that all the informations regarding the next talks will be available in the SOFI website, www.sofiwf.com. So you can get their link for the next talk in the website. So keep looking at the website every time to get your link for the next talk. The next talk is at Indian time, 1 p.m. The talk is by Shane Willis. So we join very soon. We join back very soon. Thank you, Shane, for Zoom. Thank you very much. Namaste.